right, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, the testing and emulation environment within Zephyr and uh, how we can accelerate code coverage with something that I'm calling the generic test coupled with um, emulator backend APIs. So we're gonna start off with a uh, quick um, overview of what the um, Zephyr emulation system is like. Um, then introduce the generic test and backend emula emulator API. Uh, and then we're gonna do sort of a, a walkthrough of an implementation of that, uh, just so that uh, we can all get very familiar with how to do that. And uh, hopefully we can maybe try that ourselves with a particular sensor or driver that um, uh, we like to use. So a little bit about myself first. So I'm a uh, firmware engineer at Google working on Chrome OS. Uh, so my team does the embedded controller for uh, Chromebook devices. So we're sort of a uh, system management a microcontroller that lives on the device and is uh, responsible for managing things like um, charging, keyboards, sensors, um, USB power delivery stack, uh, sort of these uh, low-level functionality uh, things in the Chromebook. And uh, we're actually an open source project, so you can feel free to check us out, look at our code. Um, and then over in the um, public Zephyr world, I contribute to um, the Zephyr sensors system uh, and those also have worked on uh, the testing and Twister. So if you uh, submit a PR to the sensor drivers, uh, there's a good chance it might be one of your reviewers. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, start off with Zephyr emulators. All right, so when we're talking about emulators in this context, uh, we're not exactly going into things like QMU or hardware emulation. Um, the best description I have for what a Zephyr, em a Zephyr emulator is would be more like a um, mock peripheral. Um, so obviously your embedded application is gonna be interacting with a lot of things like uh, GPIO, ADCs, I2C buses. Um, but if you wanna be able to compile and test your application on uh, a host PC, um, obviously we're gonna need to substitute uh, that kind of hardware in with something else because um, it wouldn't be available otherwise. And so Zephyr has this concept of emulators that uh, can stand in for these devices. They are coded in C, uh, and you'd be normally using these in a uh, native POSIX, native SIM uh, test environment. Uh, so you can piece together sort of a replica of your hardware uh, in the device tree for your test using these pieces. Uh, and it's super powerful for validating your application uh, without having to use real hardware. Um, this is a lot faster to iterate through, and uh, you can also run it in your CI, so you can get automatic you know, regression testing and make sure that nothing you're doing is accidentally breaking something. Uh, so the sort of flow when you're doing this is that you would have unit test code up top, um, and this would be calling into the normal Zephyr APIs, so we're gonna focus on sensors today, so we'll call into the sensor API, um, that interacts with whatever driver that you want to be testing. Um, and then that sensor driver is doing I2C operations, but instead of going out to a you know, chip I2C driver, um, it's actually talking to a sort of a virtual I2C bus, uh, the I2C emule. Uh, and that in turn is talking to a virtual uh, sensor emulator. Um, and so those two parts, the uh, driver under test and the emulator uh, are kind of what are working together uh, to power that unit test. And uh, the role of the emulator here is basically um, act like the chip. So it accepts I2C operations, it has an internal register store, um, can return data that's being read to it. Um, basically act the same way that a normal sensor would. So a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about today are applicable to other classes of devices, but uh, for the sake of this talk, we're gonna be focusing mostly on these sensor emulators specifically. So uh, if I haven't mentioned already, um, the testing and emulation is a good thing. Um, so we of course want to you know, provide our users with the most stable and um, uh, bug-free uh, code possible, right? And so uh, unfortunately we do have sometimes have run into issues with the uh, sensor drivers, right? And so um, as a reviewer, I do get to see kind of what um, kind of bug fixes come through from time to time. Um, and one of the common categories of bugs are uh, things that have to do with sort of um, range problems on sensors, um, and also unutilized features. Um, I don't wanna like uh, call out particular sensors or PRs in this talk, but um, 
One kind of problem, just to give you an idea that kind of happens a lot, is somebody will um, develop a driver for, let's say, a temperature sensor and commit that upstream, and maybe they were using it in like a room setting like this, um, testing a pretty narrow range of temperatures, and it works perfectly for that application. But when somebody else comes along later down the road, um, and they want to use this temperature sensor in, like, say, a, a freezer or a weather station or something where it's being exposed to a much broader range, um, they'll find that the driver crashes because it's never actually seen a negative number before or something like this, right? Um, I have also, in one case, seen a situation where uh, a sensor uh, purported to support um, operation on I2C and SPY, uh, a dual bus um, feature, but if you initialize it in the spy mode, it would actually immediately seg fault. Um, and so I might have actually been the first person to run that code, but it was in the tree. And so I think um, issues like this are an opportunity for improvement. And I think that the emulation and uh, testing combination uh, is a really, really good way to thoroughly test uh, these drivers, work all the different features, get good code coverage, all the branches, um, and then be able to ship a uh, driver that we are pretty confident in and stable. Now, of course, there is some time investment involved here. And so part of this talk is going to be to propose a system that makes this a little bit easier. But uh, I do think overall that it is worth it. Um, so when we're talking about a typical sensor plus emulator test, um, this kind of mirrors the uh, slides we were looking at earlier. But we have that test code, right, calling sensor API functionality. So it hits the driver. Driver is doing its I2C operations like normal, talking to this emulated sensor. Now, in order to you know, close the loop right here, the test also has to be able to um, control the emulator, basically set expected values, expected state, so that when we talk to it through the driver, uh, we can actually like, make sure that you know, it did the thing that we wanted it to. Um, so how does that work? Typically, these uh, sensors, sorry, emulators, will expose some kind of custom API to allow you to configure it into a particular state. Um, so you might have a function like this, where we say um, uh, set register hex 45 to that ugly hexadecimal number. Um, that would, in this case, be encoding some kind of temperature reading in the native register uh, encoding that that driver uses, which is non-standard almost all the time. We then you know, call the API to get a sample using uh, fetch get or whatever. Uh, and then we just compare that what we got out from the driver is what we uh, programmed into the emulator to begin with. Um, and so this works pretty well. This basically tests the data path of the sensor. But um, if you do this a lot, you'll suddenly notice that um, this one part right here is kind of the only step that's unique to a device, right? Um, if you could have a standardized way of talking to these emulators and let the emulator be in charge of uh, doing that conversion from you know, like a real-world SI number into um, a register representation, then the test could suddenly be like reusable. Um, and that's what we're going to explore in the remainder of this talk. So step one, let's standardize an API to talk to these emulators and uh, basically configure them um, for testing. So one of the important points that we want to emphasize here is that uh, we should not be exposing any kind of implementation details about how the sensor represents a particular reading, right? Uh, we saw earlier that a lot of times these sensors will just have strange um, counts for how they represent temperatures and other readings. Uh, it could be in like weird units like eighth of a degree. Um, we definitely don't want to have to be dealing with that. And so if we can basically uh, make the emulator responsible for accepting a real world value and you know, it being the expert on the chip that it's emulating, uh, map that into whatever it needs to do, uh, then that would make the uh, test side a lot easier. Uh, and finally, if we can um, add some kind of discoverability mechanism to the emulator, uh, such that we can learn from the emulator what channels and what their respective ranges are, um, then we can really have a generic test coupled with this that's able to um, basically test the chip without knowing anything about it, only what it learns through the emulator. Um, so I should 
mention that the concept of a backend emulator API is not completely new in Zephyr. There are some other classes of device that have been doing this. But I think it's particularly important that we bring this to uh, the sensors world just because there's such a huge variety of sensors out there. Um, there are dozens, probably over 100 drivers that are in use. And so I think that's a, a high impact area to deploy this. So let's dive into what this API actually looks like. And so this is gonna be the point where I walk up to the screen and like point out some things, but uh, unfortunately it's like 20 feet tall. Um, so the main function is uh, set channel, all right? So given a uh, channel enum, and this could be something like ambient temp, uh, Excel, XYZ, uh, there's a list of them in Zephyr if you wanna take a look. Uh, so given a channel enum, um, set the particular value on an emulator, and then the emulator should do whatever it needs to do internally to make sure that the next read from that channel returns a given value. And then we also have the um, associated get sample range function, which is what we use for that discoverability mechanism. Um, that's able to, if a channel is supported, basically return an upper and lower bound, uh, so we know what to basically test with. And also an epsilon value, which sort of is like a tolerance, um, and that basically encodes the like bit depth or sample resolution of that sensor, just so that we're not trying to um, expect an output that's tighter than the sensor can actually provide, you know? Uh, we have since expanded this to also talk about uh, sensor attributes, although um, this is still up and coming, so we're not gonna focus on that too much, but just wanted to call that out in case you go look at the API, which is, by the way, in uh, emulsensor.h if you wanna follow along in the code. All right, so that takes care of the emulator side. Let's go on to the generic test. So I have a wonderful flowchart about how uh, we can step through that process and uh, how it can work. So first thing we need to do is detect if the um, emulator in question actually supports the backend API. Um, if it doesn't, we're obviously just gonna skip that. Um, but if so, we can start that channel discovery routine where we're gonna iterate through all the different channel types that Zephyr supports. And if we don't get an error code back from this function, we will basically uh, store that channel information, the ranges, um, in a table inside the test. And from there, we can go ahead and interpolate some test values. So obviously we're going to be using the absolute minimum and absolute maximum that the sensor supports. But then uh, by default, we also um, pick a total of uh, five, uh, so three additional points uh, that are linearly interspersed along the sensor's range. Uh, that's configurable if you wanna do something else. Uh, but we store those values and then basically we can, one at a time, go through, set those on the emulator and it will do whatever it needs to do to um, update its internal state, uh, convert from a real world SI unit. Um, everything in the generic test is using real world units um, such that when we read it back, we get that expected value returned from the sensor driver that we are testing. Uh, and then we can just do a simple uh, comparison. Are we in tolerance or are we not? Um, if not, we can abort the test at that point and uh, return some information to the user. Uh, but if we do pass, then we can continue and uh, keep doing this for the other uh, sets of expected values. Um, we basically will try to do every supported channel um, at once and then repeat that for each of the five expected values, uh, just to do a little bit in parallel. Uh, and then finally, we can repeat this for any other sensor that we want to. So I did wanna go on a little bit of a side trip here and talk about uh, fixed point numbers and the sensors V2 framework. Um, so if you noticed in the API that we showed a couple slides ago, uh, the values had a type uh, Q31T, um, and there was this other parameter called shift associated with them. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so this is a representation that is being used by the uh, newer sensors V2 API. If you haven't heard about this before, uh, you're probably not alone. This is sort of an experimental uh, slash uh, soft launch feature that's been in the works. But we think it makes sense to start adopting this for um, new code, such as the generic test. Um, and one of the things that we're doing in this new API is we're no longer using the uh, sensor value struct where it has uh, two fields um, basically representing um, integer and then milli units 
uh, that you then have to basically add together and um, is very difficult to do arithmetic with. So we wanted to use fixed point numbers in a 32-bit container instead. Uh, and this makes a lot of the arithmetic easier in the processing with sensor data. Um, the rest of the sensor V2 system um, basically plays more nicely with um, uh, Zephyr's DSP systems and uh, enables higher throughput reads through uh, the real-time I.O. technology. Um, there is a slide at the very end that has a link to more information about this. I just wanted to quickly mention it because you might uh, see some references to it in the rest of this talk. Um, but aside from that, we're going to focus mostly on the uh, fixed point numbers here. Um, and so I'm sure you're all familiar with how um, counting in binary works, but in the fixed point case, basically what we're going to do is we're going to apply uh, fractional weights to some of the bit positions in the number, right? So um, we're familiar with two's complement that you can kind of see there on the left, but we can keep extending uh, to negative powers of two on the right. Uh, and so basically we can start encoding um, fractional numbers in binary, and you don't need a floating point unit to work with this, so it's very friendly to uh, smaller hardware. This is really common in the DSP space, so if there's any DSP engineers out there, uh, you probably, probably know all this by heart. Um, when what's, one of the, what's one of the benefits of this is that um, we can actually adjust the precision of this by moving around where our virtual decimal point is. All right, so if you have uh, a sensor that's spitting out really large numbers, you can sort of trade off some of those fractional bits to have more space or more headroom um, on the integer side. And the location of this decimal point is sort of defined by the um, shift value. Um, this is a little bit different from the Q notation that you might be familiar with from the DSP world, but um, it sort of implies the same thing. Um, on the next slide, I got a couple examples of what different shift values um, mean in terms of range. Um, so you basically, every time you have one of these Q31 uh, sensor values, it has to be accompanied by a shift value that um, communicates to whoever's consuming it uh, where that decimal point lies and what the actual range of the number is. Um, but this is flexible and allows you to basically get the best um, precision that works for your sensor. Um, so a couple examples are out here on the board. Um, zero, shift to zero basically means that you have a minus one to just shy of one range to work with, um, all the way up to 31, in which case you have zero fractional bits and it's just a, an int 32. So just to do a quick example, since being able to work with this is important if you want to use the backend API. Um, if you had a temperature sensor that has a range of negative 10 to 100, uh, what would be the appropriate shift value to use with that? Um, well, the answer would be seven, um, because that would give us a range of negative 128 to just shy of 128. That fits our range. That's the, well, the smallest shift that fits our range. Um, so that's what we would use. And if you wanted to convert back and forth, there's a billion ways to represent this arithmetic, but you're basically just doing a rescaling. Um, this one makes it very clear how the shift is incorporated. Um, and that is how the temperature value of 50 degrees would look like in hex um, in memory. Um, if there were um, decimal places to that number, you would see more bits being set um, uh, in the lower significant bits. Uh, one thing to be mindful of when you're working with this is um, it is possible to overflow pretty quickly since you're dealing with some larger numbers here. So you might have to use an N64 container temporarily while you're doing the arithmetic. Uh, and you want to order your operations carefully to make sure that you don't have any um, rounding issues if you um, lose precision by doing you know, too many divides, for example. Um, but this, this will make more sense once you start working with this and uh, can study some code. Um, it is a little bit of a learning curve, but you'll, you will get used to it. All right, so for the last part, we're going to basically take a tour of a particular uh, implementation. Uh, we'll take a look at the generic test as it lives right now. Um, it is actually live within Zephyr right now, and there are about, uh, I believe, three or maybe four sensors that are using this mechanism. Um, we're going to take a look at the uh, AKM09918C digital compass um, because that's something we had on the dev board that was lying around. Uh, so that's been one of our sort of uh, test sensors to work with. So first thing we're going to do is um, add 
a backend API implementation to the emulator for this part. And so uh, as a prerequisite here, we're going to assume that we already do have an emulator for this part. Uh, that is something you have to set up first. But that's actually honestly not too challenging because a lot of these devices um, uh, work pretty similarly under the hood. And so you can, with a little bit of copying and pasting, put something together in not too much time. Uh, but the first thing we're going to implement here is that uh, get sample range function that we talked about earlier. This is a pretty simple sensor. Uh, it supports the channels that we have laid out right here. Uh, it's a magnetometer, so three axis. Um, each axis has the exact same range. It's uh, plus minus 49.12 uh, uh, Gs. And so that number means that we want to use a shift of six plus minus 64. Uh, so we're basically going to um, return shift of six. We're going to compute the uh, upper range based on that formula that we looked at in the other slides. Uh, we can copy it over for lower. And then the epsilon, uh, in this case, is basically based on the value of one least significant bit um, in the register of the chip. All right, so that's basically our precision. Um, I recommend sometimes scaling it up by like 1.5 or so just to give you a little bit of headroom when there might be rounding errors in other parts of the code. Um, but basically we're saying here is that you're never going to see um, a step smaller than that figure. If the uh, Caller is requesting a channel that is not one of the three above. Uh, we basically return E not supported. Um, we uh, do not use the uh, triplet samples. So there is a magnetometer XYZ single channel, but for simplicity, we just handle them each separately. All right, so let's take a look at the other function that we implement. This is the one that actually sets the channel. Uh, this is uh, only half of it, so we just do some input validation to start off, make sure that uh, we're only accepting values for channels that um, we support. So once again, we'll see the magnetometer X, Y, and Z. Um, otherwise, we return an error. And then we're basically just going to do some of that math in reverse so that we can convert that uh, real-world SI unit number into whatever register representation this chip actually needs. And so as you can see below, we're basically going to uh, convert this down to a 16-bit value that we can uh, shove into our register store. Um, all emulators have some concept of representing the registers that are on chip internally. Uh, in this case, there's just a array called reg, um, probably of uh, size uh, int eight. And uh, we basically put the upper and lower half of the uh, reading into it. Uh, one other thing that we have to do at this point is uh, set the um, basically data ready bit at the top right there. Uh, this particular chip has a bit in a status register that gets set whenever a new reading is available. Um, the driver will actually refuse to read any samples if that bit is not set. Uh, so we have to set it here. Um, we are an emulator, so we have to behave like the real chip in order to make the driver work correctly. We're also uh, clamping the value down just in case somebody uh, sends in something that's way higher than the chip actually supports. Um, we don't want to allow invalid uh, register writes to take place, so we do a clamp. But um, long story short, you give this a value in uh, Gs, or meters per second squared, I think. Uh, and it will do the right thing to make sure that the register gets set up accordingly. The last thing to do is basically to declare a backend API struct, um, give it references to both of those two functions, and then we register it in the emul dt ins define macro. So the generic emul struct uh, that exists in Zephyr um, actually has a, um, a void pointer for a backend API already included. Uh, and you can set that with the last parameter in that macro, which is almost always null, because uh, people haven't been using this before. But we'll take advantage of it. So that's all the work that we need to do over on the uh, emulator side to um, basically get it ready for a generic test. Um, so if you were adding this functionality to a new emulator, um, you could stop there, actually. The rest of this is just to uh, talk about how the generic test itself is implemented uh, so we can get familiar with uh, how it operates. And so 
Generic test um, is live today, as I mentioned, and it's part of the uh, sensor build all test. So this is a particular unit test that lives inside Zephyr that has a device tree associated with it that lists all the different sensors that Zephyr supports, uh, categorized by what type of bus they're on. And so this is a really convenient place to start because it is the expectation that any new sensor driver gets registered here already. Um, so we can basically use device tree macros to iterate uh, through that list of sensors. And um, every time we reach one, we could basically uh, declare uh, a new Z test uh, test function for that device. We get the device pointer automatically filled in. Uh, and we can call this run generic test function, which actually carries out the test. Uh, and we are repeating this for every single um, sensor that we know about. Um, but the first check in the uh, run generic test function is whether or not there is actually an emulator and the backend API associated with it. Um, if it's not, then we're going to skip that test. Um, basically, it's hard to detect just from the device tree macros alone whether or not a sensor supports this. Um, but this also provides some useful um, test uh, collateral because you can basically see in your uh, output all the tests and all the sensors that don't have support. So you can use that to kind of target which um, devices we want to uh, work on. Um, one of the other benefits of this build all test is actually now a run all test, I should say. Um, since we actually are initializing Zephyr, um, it will go through and run the init function at least on all of these drivers, um, which will at least test the initialization function of each driver, um, which does help a little bit. Sometimes that catches bugs on its own. Uh, but we are going past simply building, despite what the name implies. All right, so going a little bit further down in the uh, generic test function, uh, we're gonna do that channel discovery routine that we mentioned earlier. So iterate through all the known channels. Uh, we're gonna keep track of which ones um, the sensor emulator is actually able to support. Uh, we build out a table of um, channels and ranges. And then the final step that we do at the bottom right there is do that interpolation. So uh, we create a set of test values that we can work with. And once we have those, we can start setting them on the emulator. So the key function here is emul sensor backend set channel. Uh, that calls into that API that we defined earlier. Uh, we give it the value, uh, we give it the channel. Emulator goes off and does the right thing. We will then go ahead and uh, read those uh, values back from the driver, which is then, of course, talking through the emulator. And uh, we capture all of those into our table. Uh, and then we can finally do a uh, comparison at the end to make sure that we got back what we expected. So the first thing that we're actually gonna do in this case is um, unshift everything. Um, so one of the consequences of um, fixed point numbers is that if your decimal point is actually not in the same spot between two numbers, um, you cannot directly compare those or do arithmetic on them because the bits mean different things. Uh, so we basically just take that whole uh, problem um, out by unshifting everything it fills an N64 container in this case, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we're running on PCs here. It, that's actually the native size. Um, so once we've unshifted the actual, the expected, and the um, allowed error, the epsilon value, we just use the zassert within macro right here uh, to see if we are intolerance. If not, we can report an error to the user. Um, otherwise, we can just continue in the loop, testing all the other sets of values and um, eventually moving on to other sensors. All right, so in conclusion, if you can write a backend API plus emulator for a sensor, uh, you basically get a free test. Um, obviously, this will not be able to test every single feature of your sensor driver, but it does cover the data path, which I think is one of the most important things to focus on. Uh, and you can always still write a, you know, dedicated unit test for that sensor on the side uh, where you work, you know, sensor specific features. Um, and so my uh, ask for you guys today is that if there is a particular sensor in Zephyr that is important to your product or project, uh, consider taking some time out of your day to contribute an emulator uh, and backend API implementation for it. Um, it does not actually take as much time as you may be fearing. Uh, I would estimate maybe like half uh, to one day if you are, you know, generally well versus Zephyr. And um, you know, even if you think 
you've got a perfect driver that you wrote. You, know, you never know, it could be somebody else's PR down the road that introduces the regression into it. And if there's not testing going on to catch situations like that, um, then that is the vulnerability that um, you know, we don't want to accidentally have happen. Um, but the best recommendation I have would be to try to, every time you develop a new driver for a sensor, do the emulator alongside while it's fresh in your head. Um, that's kind of the easiest time to just uh, crank that out. Um, so as promised, at the end I have a couple of uh, references. So these are all various PRs that are associated with uh, the generic test and the uh, backend emulator API project. Um, at the very bottom here is a reference to another talk from uh, last year's conference about the sensors V2 thing, if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so feel free to take a picture or download the slides from the web. Um, I'll leave that up for a little bit longer. Uh, but aside from that, uh, we can go ahead and uh, enter the Q&A session. Um, so yeah, do we have any questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, does the uh, emulator backend have an interrupt uh, emulator as well, so you can do things like triggering and that kind of stuff, or just uh, registers uh, on the bar, on the S squared C bus, or that kind of thing? Yeah. So right now it's just uh, register-based um, one-off reads, but since we are tying into the Zephyr, sorry, the Sensor V2 um, API right here, that does open up possibilities for um, that kind of asynchronous. Uh, sensor reads that are often triggered by interrupts. So I think there's potential to work on that there. Um, if it's like really particular to a certain sensor, then that might be a case where you do need to unfortunately write a dedicated unit test for that driver though. Okay, thanks. Also, uh, I hadn't seen sensors uh, V2 before. Um, uh, is there a reason that the 32-bit um, uh, and the 8-bit are separate and not in a structure like they were for V1? with the integer and fraction? Or is it just they decided to do it that way because they decided to do it that way? Yeah, so the main benefit of having the uh, single fixed point value is that arithmetic gets a lot easier. Mm. Um, so you can actually add, um, as long as the shift value is identical, you can actually add and subtract those together um, uh, and do multiplication on them. The previous implementation where you had the uh, um, sensor value struct where it had you know, basically two numbers and one uh, made that pretty complicated because basically the first thing everybody would do would be to um, somehow so recombine those two values. Yeah, so they would multiply, you know, the the first number by a million, then add the the micro units into yep. it or something like that, um, which you know could overflow or maybe isn't actually suitable for the application. Um, so. There is, of course, more of a learning curve to the Q31 numbers, but um, I do think it's possible to get used to it, and I think it's uh, an overall improvement. Oh, no, I understand that. I was mm -hmm. just wondering why the 32 and the 8 are two separate things being passed in and out rather than just oh, a okay. struct. Oh, so You're a... saying could those be within one struct? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they could be. Um, just wondered if there was a reason that it was done that way, that's all. It might be for compatibility with the Ah. Yes, yeah, uh, so yeah. Keith's comments is uh, it might be for compatibility with a DSP layer. Um, yeah, I think a lot of this was designed with that in mind, so that could definitely be the explanation. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Just a note on that question. It could possibly be due to array support. If you have an array of 16 samples, you don't need the shift value repeated 16 times. Yeah, so are you saying um, whether or not you could have a, a whole buffer of samples that are described by one shift parameter? Yeah, so actually in the um, census v2 system, when you are doing like larger batched reads, um, the shift value is only sent once, um, and then you'll have a whole buffer of samples. Um, for the emulator API right now, we're really only supporting just one-off samples, so it, this is just a simpler way to do it. But I definitely do see potential to expand this uh, in the future to basically set up um, like maybe a whole waveform on the emulator so that when you do multiple reads in a row, it just returns one after another, and then you could use that to characterize uh, a filter or something like that. 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Well, one of the things you mentioned while before actually explaining how the emulator worked and stuff uh, was about a bug that, for instance, you have a driver or a sensor that it's working over I2C that it's not working over SPY. Mm -hmm. So kind of like, I'm curious, how would this emulator detect those kind of problems? Yeah, so that one was actually caught um, when we turned the build all test into a run all test. Because uh, then it started initializing all those sensors, and that's when we started seeing some problems with some of them. Um, so in that case, there was not an emulator involved, uh, but it did shine some more light on uh, and run some more code than we had been in the past. Any other questions for Tristan? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I kept thinking about that epsilon and padding it a little bit, and I was wondering if you considered in the uh, emulator API to get back not only the epsilon, but maybe Q31 type that uh, the API will calculate as this is what I should have after losing precision, and use that as well for the like exact comparison, not to get into um, well, actually use them together with Epsilon as a double check because that last bit sometimes can be important because if the mm -hmm. driver is truncating the last bit, that is actually noise. So I was wondering if that could be an option. Yeah, that's a good point. So basically saying um, pre-compute what the actual value should be just so that if there are regressions along the path that mm -hmm. maybe even minorly affect the accuracy that those can get caught. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, actually. OK, thank you. All right, any final questions? All right, well, thank you so much for attending. It was uh, nice talking with all of you. And uh, hopefully, I can uh, review some drivers and emulators from you guys. <laughs> <laughs>